if you're a young boy with gynecomastia and you're starting to, to develop breast tissue, you're probably going to want to go have that excised to make sure that you look and feel more like a boy. That is gender-affirming care for a cisgendered male, and nobody bats an eye at that. But, you know, when it's a trans kid, now all of a sudden, we're a bit more worried about it because, oh, well, they can't make those decisions for themselves. Like, I fear that people who do have that view, where they don't necessarily care about sports and they think hey just let everyone compete it will actually lead to the elimination of females in in sports pretty much across the board and that will give such a piece of utility towards the transphobic view that people might vote differently because of that one issue alone because it's so present and obvious but um but hey another area we disagree on. no I, I can definitely see where you're coming from and like it, it you, you you make some fair points and i can i can i get where you're I'm smelling what you're stepping on. So what you end up with is this weird hill that people die on where all of a sudden anthropology, sociology, psychology aren't real science anymore. All the biology textbooks that talk about gender diversity and sexual diversity and transsexual people and transgender people, those aren't actual biology textbooks anymore. Those are new woke biology textbooks. And like, they just, they, they build this insane little wall around their bizarrely narrow and parochial worldview just to protect their own comfort to, to remain in the heuristics that they grew up with. It's a very dogmatic way of thinking, and it's, it's weird for people who claim to be pro-science to do. Why hello, my fellow apes. Welcome to the Rational Roundtable. Our guest today is the forever happy Forrest Valkai. Forrest is a biologist and science communicator who uses his YouTube platform of the same name to teach exciting science lessons, promote compassion and skepticism, and share his boundless love for life with audiences of all ages. And today, we're here to discuss sex and gender. Forrest, thank you very, very much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So let's start at the very beginning. What was our ancestors' understanding of sex? What was their views? So there's a lot that we do and don't know. Um, it's very likely that their concept of sex would have just been totally limited to their external phenotype, just whatever they could see with their eyes. But even in that, there's a lot of variation. And so they might have just gone with external genitalia. They might have gone with secondary sex characteristics. It, it's hard to say. What we do know for sure is that we do see like gendered behaviors and gendered roles and different treatments of different people and it across, you know, history and culture. But as far as like what they actually thought about biological sex, it's hard to know if they had that concept or if they conflated sex and gender as one solid thing, although that's exceedingly unlikely. Yeah, no, I can it's very hard to ascertain that information. You mentioned a uh, phenotype. I believe, I believe that's the word that you used. Is can you expand upon that? Is that like physical appearance? Is it is it morphology? What precisely is that? So your genotype is your DNA. It's just what your genome is telling your body to be. Your phenotype is what your body actually is. It is your outward presentation. Now, when we talk about phenotype in terms of sex determination in early civilizations, they're obviously not cutting anybody open to see what plumbing they have before they address them as a person. They're probably just looking on the surface level. So that's what we'd be eliminating. To. So it's basically just done on observation. They'd look around and go, eh, that guy's got wide shoulders, you know, got a penis. Uh, if you can see that at all, um, has facial hair, more muscle mass. We're gonna that might be a man, whereas they would look at someone else and they go wider hips, breasts, more. F I was gonna say feminine features, but that's begging the question. But you get the point. Like it was done by observation, right? So you mentioned about gender there. So do we actually know what our ancestors, what historical cultures have thought about gender? Yeah, so I, I said a minute ago that it would have been very unlikely that they were just conflating sex and gender all the time. While that probably was the case sometimes and maybe early on, as we look back over the anthropological record, we see tons of gender-diverse cultures across the world and throughout history. We see cultures with more than two genders. We see cultures with totally different gender roles and totally different gender expectations. Even in our own culture, we look back across, you know, Western society, and there was a time when men would wear powder makeup to make their skin white and put on beauty marks and wear powdered wigs. It was manly for a man to faint and swoon and weep with emotion. 
all things that certainly wouldn't be considered super manly in like 1960s America. No, that makes sense. It makes me think actually of uh, the Romans and what their views were of men. They would basically have like this very, you'd have to have your hair cut, no facial hair. It, it, it was part of the manly image, but also part of not being a barbarian. And so like, I know it's not gender, but like these views of what they had for what is right and what is wrong for your presentation. It's very interesting. So it sounds like when it comes to these cultures, I appreciate it's very hard to make any inference about what they thought of sex and even gender. But is it was it typically broken down on man and woman and then they had different views of what it is to be a man and a woman? Did they tend to focus on a binary? Is that like the norm or what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's it's largely broken down into a group of two, but it's really important to point out that or lots of lots of cultures those two weren't the only options, and generally speaking, there was a continuum of variation between them. So you talk about, like, twin spirit people in Native American cultures, which twin spirit is kind of a blanket term for several different concepts of a third or fourth gender that took place across several different nations across the Americas. You can look at the Hedra people in India. You can see third genders in Hawaii and in South America and in Africa. There's tons and tons of data out there about this stuff. And you can even see, if you go to PBS, there's a map of gender-diverse cultures around the world where you can sit here and click and play and interact and learn more about it. This is not a secret in the bioanthropological community. I guess, coming from a Western country with a Western background, it's, and particularly because of the influence of the religions that have had power in the West, the binary is so important and integral to those religions and to those cultures and they build their rules and regulations and classes based around it, that it can be very easy to just accept the world that is in front of you and think, okay, it is binary, or at least everyone thinks it's binary. But as you said, when you look into the anthropology and you look into, you know, you take some time to look at other cultures, you realise just how how many, how many broad people's views are and what gender is specifically. Um, yeah, very, very interesting stuff. And... As, as you've just uh, linked, that will be linked below for everybody to take a look at. But what you just said there is also super important because, like, we have to remember that the field of anthropology and a lot of biology as well was founded by literally Victorian men with literally Victorian ideas about the world. And they would go out into different cultures and ask the nearest man, how do you run this place? And, and how do you, you know, make sure the women do their jobs and all this stuff? And the man would be like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. She runs this place and we're pretty egalitarian and we don't have that kind of society. And they'd be like, don't be stupid. How do you run this place and how do you keep the women in line? And they would destroy evidence that went against the, their culture and their norms and their ideas of what a civilized proper society should be because they had an interest in doing that. And so we see that a lot today when people are kind of butting up against the walls of the heuristics that they've had their entire life, trying to see gender and sex as a more diverse thing that it is. They've been told that it's this one way. They grew up in a culture that said that it's this one way. It's been this one way for hundreds of years. And now all of a sudden, something's coming in that's challenging not only their view of you know the world around them, but their view of their place in it and of everybody else and of hierarchical structures in their society that they rely on and maybe even don't think about all the time. And now they have to. And that can be really scary. But it's really important for progress. Yes. Well, we'll get to progress soon because I have a few questions that relate to this. So with gender, when did the word gender start catching on? So the word gender became more popular in the scientific literature starting around the 1950s. But it actually goes back a little bit further than that. You can look back as far as Magnus Hirschfeld in the 1930s who was a physician and a sexologist in Germany, who amassed a library. He started the Institute of Sexual Research, and he had thousands and thousands of books and research documents about sex and gender and sexuality and gender expression, trans people versus cis people, homosexuals versus heterosexuals. He was studying this stuff and making massive progress on it, and that was one of the first places that the Nazis destroyed. They burned thousands and thousands of his books, and killed half of the people that were working for him, and then revoked his German citizenship and exiled him. So we probably would have learned a lot more about this a lot earlier if it hadn't been for the rise of fascism. That fascist response, I 
I need to find it again. If anyone listening knows this story, please do link it. But I remember hearing of a Spanish traveller who went from Europe um, and started travelling and looking at other communities. And he ended up getting a community of people uh, put to death because he found that the men wore dresses. Now, that really speaks towards the same you know, the same disposition that the Nazis had when it was, that doesn't fit our ideology, it's an abomination, it can't just be they have a different view on how we look at gender, it has to be that is not just wrong, but exterminate it, you know, destroy it. This just strikes me as such a weird disposition, but it's very prominent when it comes to a topic, and I think you touched upon why, it's because it affects people personally. Um, Yeah, it's a difficult, it's a difficult one. Humans are like grotesquely tribalistic creatures, and that's a good and a bad thing. There's 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 a lot of happy positive to that that you can draw from it. But at its worst, that's the kind of thing that it brings about. You're different than me, therefore you must be evil. And we see that quite a bit over the history of of, of fascist thinking, of nationalist thinking, of religious thinking, trying to other somebody and then using them as an outsider to dehumanize them and eventually inevitably kill them. When we talk about, you know, gender diversity and sexual diversity in civilizations now, we kind of see the same thing, where lots of people here in in the global north like to pretend like these are just strange aberrations from, from everything. It's not that this one civilization that we live in bulldozed through the entire world and murdered everybody who disagreed with them. No, certainly not that. It's just that all these other culturals were just liberals, and that's that's really what the problem was. <laughs> okay, so a very common argument I hear against recognizing gender is that it, 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 as a distinction from sex, it's very, quote, new. How do you respond to that objection? I would say that anybody who takes science seriously wouldn't use that objection, because When we get new images from the James Webb Space Telescope, we don't say, well, these images are new, so we're going to go back and use the old Hubble images as well, because these are clearly woke leftist images from James Webb. No, we learn new things, and we adapt our worldview based on those new things. That's how science has always worked. The discovery of what fossils actually are, the discovery of evolution, the destruction of this idea of like the hierarchical chain of being, these were things that fundamentally changed our understanding of the universe and our place in it. They knocked us off of our pedestal again and again and again. And here we're just seeing the same thing. We had one model, and that model actually didn't work as well as we thought. We learned new stuff, and now we need to adapt to that new stuff. That's how science works and has always worked. That's how thinking has always worked. Unfortunately, what people keep doing in this debate is pretending like the boxes that we have drawn around nature are somehow eternal and immutable realities when they simply are not. And anybody who studied anything about biology knows that that's never the case. Nature is what nature is. And all we do is look for patterns. And then when we find a pattern, we draw a little box around that pattern. And then we look a little closer at that box and we find actually this one box needs to be two or three boxes. And actually this corner of the box doesn't really belong in the box. We need to take it out of the box. And we just keep refining our understanding of what nature actually is. But if our models end up not fitting with reality, that's not reality's problem. That is our problem. And so we just change the boxes. It's what we've always done. It's what we're doing now. And for some reason, in this one particularly politicized context, people like to act like that's not allowed. And it's very weird. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I think you're bang on the money with it being a politicized topic. Because the way that this is phrased, it's not just like, oh, it's new. That's interesting. You, you concerned about that. It's like, oh, look, trans ideology is occurring right now. And all of a sudden you're getting gender invented as a word and they want you to change your institutions. And to me, it really is scientific ignorance to not realize that in basically every science during the same time, during the 20th century, we've had our world completely flipped upside down. It's like when they discovered the Big Bang, they didn't start going, oh, look, they're inventing words such as cosmic expansion. Um, The idea of Newton and his, his how he saw gravity, we've completely, completely flipped that on its head. We've invented general relativity and special re- uh, relativity. 
And yet, like, they're not like people are not going up to it and going, oh, this is an ideological change right here. It's like, no, we've discovered things. And so we've changed our language and our models to to better make sense of it. Same with DNA. And um, on, on the topic of gender being a new term, I mean, the, the word homosexual didn't exist until about the mid-19th century. But that doesn't mean that people weren't jousting and smashing pasties before. Of, of course they were. It's just as we expanded and learned more about the world, we refined our language. Because ultimately, that's what language is. It, it's labels that we give to the world to categorize things. There's nothing right or wrong about them. It's just you need to have certain definitions in order to capture utility. And um, I, th I think that's the thing that most frustrates me with this whole what is a woman kind of debate. It's like, dude, it's just a word. You just ask the person what they mean by it, and then you can probably make some progress. If you want to convince someone of what word you use, then it's going to come down to an argument about utility. Yeah, and, and that's what's so frustrating about it, is that like, we, you know, we, we have this phrase in science that all models are wrong, some of them are useful. When you think about like a map, for example, an old map from the 1500s is wrong. But it's a lot better than not having a map at all. It didn't have the Americas on there because they didn't know that those existed. But it was a better thing than just being completely blind. And now we have Google satellite images that can like perfectly depict the Earth. And guess what? Those maps are wrong because they're still vectors trying to be put onto a weird shape. And you're going to have some inconsistencies and the planet's going to change underneath it. And the picture isn't up to date. At the end of the day, the Earth is what the Earth looks like. Every map is wrong, but some of them are useful. And it's the same thing we talk about science, we talk about language, anything. Reality is what reality is. Every model, every theory, every bit of language we have is wrong. But that doesn't mean that it's worthless, and it doesn't mean that it doesn't need to change. It just means we need to update it as much as we can with the best information we have and keep going from there. And what you said just a minute ago is so monumentally important about how homosexuals were always there, we just suddenly started recognizing them. Just like how the Americas were always there, and it took us discovering them and putting on the map to then update our information and our understanding of the world. Homosexuality used to be illegal in this country where I'm at now. Cross-dressing used to be illegal in this country. There were laws on how many articles of feminine clothing a woman was required to wear in public. You would be arrested if you didn't meet the gender norms of the society. It, homosexuality was considered to be a mental disorder for a long time. And then, all of a sudden, we all got together and decided that actually this isn't a disease. This is just variation within human populations. And not wanting to dress a certain way isn't like some horrible rebellion against God and society. It's just people expressing themselves. And overnight, thousands and millions of people were cured of a disease that they didn't have and made a lot more free. And we can see the same kind of pattern when we look at trans people today. There was once a time when being left-handed was considered evil and demonic and left-handedness was drained out of people. And then we had a big public debate about it, and then we started accepting it. And you can look at the graph of the history of left-handedness, and it's really low, and then it goes a little bit lower, and then it spikes like crazy, and then it plateaus off. And someone living in the time of that spike might say, everybody's left-handed now, it's just a popular fad to be left-handed. This, this woke ideology teaching everybody to be left-handed all of a sudden. No, that's just how many left-handed people there always were, and then it plateaus off. And we see the same thing now with gender diversity, with sexual diversity, with trans people, intersex people, LGBT people of any flavor. They were always there. They've been here the whole time. They've been a part of history since history began. And we are now at a point where we're starting to have honest, serious conversations about them and be a little bit more accepting about them as well. And so we're seeing this massive spike and everyone says, oh, they're pushing the ideology. Everybody's trans now. In reality, all they're doing is saying hello. And eventually that will plateau off and it's going to be OK. You, you will survive in the new woke world order. <laughs> I gotta say, your passion is mwah, sublime. <laughs> I wish I had a tenth of it. I get real excitable. <laughs> Until very recently then, our ancestors and, if you will, people in general, they thought that they had this sorted. Gender isn't a thing, sex is binary, and we know this from ob observation alone. 
But what was the first scientific discovery to broaden our understanding of sex outside of just observation? I mean, I couldn't nail down the very first one, but like there's a history of our understanding of sex developing over the course of a few centuries. Back in the 1600s, we, we discovered sperm. Back in the 1800s, we discovered eggs. Back in the early 1900s, we discovered sex chromosomes. And the thing that continued to happen over and over and over is that these Western Eurocentric scientists would just kind of gloss over any irregularities in the data and just cram it into the same boxes that they had always crammed everything else. And so it wasn't until later in the 20th century that we started being a little bit more honest about what we thought were just irregularities and uh, anomalies, but were actually somewhat predictable variation within these numbers. And so we realized over time that sex is not something that's just a single switch that goes in this direction or that direction. It's actually a multivariate system with lots and lots of contributing factors. And not a single one of those factors is solely determinant of the outcome of the system. And not a single one of those factors has only two possible outcomes. So it's a lot more interesting than we thought it was. Just like everything else in biology, it's a lot cooler than the box that we tried to cram it in. So it sounds like you said that we were discovering, say, male gamete type or sperm we were we discovered sperm and then like our technology got better and we were able to discover eggs at least that's my understanding correct me if i'm wrong and i think the gap between that was like 150 years it was, it was quite a bit of time as is usually the case with studying male physiology versus female physiology yeah female physiology is usually an afterthought it well, wasn't it because the eggs are tiny like wasn't it a technological thing so like you oh, could no, pick you, up you on can... You can for sure excuse it away by pointing out the fact that they are tiny and much more difficult to retrieve. <laughs> that And that's, that's not not legitimate. Like, that's fine. But also, the fact that we had to jump through so many hoops to, like, study female orgasms or get accurate depictions of clitorises in medical textbooks and shit, like, it, it all kind of compounds together a little bit. But that's a story for a different time. Well, you know, like, we're speaking in binaries, you see, so you have to choose one or the other. It can't be a, a matter of both of those aspects. But it sounds like those first two discoveries actually would have been vindicating to the European mindset because they would have had this idea of man and woman, Adam and Eve, and they've got this morphological understanding of of what it is to be a man and a woman. And yes, there's variation, but it's approximately correct. And then you get this discovery. Oh, it looks like men can produce these small gametes and... um, on the other side, you've got you've got women. That probably would have led to a vindication in their mind. So, would you think it's fair to say that in say 1830 or so, that it would have been correct to say that it looks like they got this one right, and it was only afterwards that we start? Yeah, I see, I see what you mean. So that's interesting. Yeah, it, it, at the same this for the same reason as any other wrong thing they thought at the time would have seemed vindicated. That was the information they had at the time, and they were rocking with it, and you know. No shame in that, but now we've learned new things. And so, like, at at this moment, like, I'm not exaggerating, I have at least five different college-level biology textbooks within arm's reach of me at this very second that talk about chromosomal diversity and, and, and sex diversity and gender diversity and how sex and gender aren't the same thing and how none of them are really a strict binary system. I have, like, these are college textbooks that explain this stuff because those are the new things we've learned and we're trying to share that and get over the hump of that outdated thinking. No, I don't, I don't think you understand, good sir. The way that it works is that when the science comes out and it's fitting my, my biases, um, that's science. Right, but once it gets too far, oh, oh no, no, no! This is this is ideology right now. Like I don't like this. And any scientist who says anything different isn't a real scientist. And also, vaccines cause autism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. And actually, they agree with me. They just have to be silent because of the establishment. Exactly. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> All right. So you've got these discoveries, and then in uh, 1905 by Nettie Stevens, she discovered uh, chromosomes. I think it was with mealworm. That would have been even of a stronger vindication towards this binary view of sex specifically. And because at the time they were conflating gender, like it just would have emboldened this view. At least it seems that way to me. Is that is that a fair understanding, or is my intuitions wrong on that? Oh yeah, no, t- totally. That's the and that's that is exactly what we've been talking about. Is it's a, it 
it definitely vindicated this idea that, oh, look, look, you know, there's there's this kind of chromosomes for a female and there's this kind of chromosomes for a male. And there's also all these other chromosome variations, but like those are just female and male too. They just don't know it yet. Yeah. So that's, that's like the interesting thing. So from my understanding, they would have had like this, here's the discovery. It adds to our ideas and it, it bolsters and vindicates what we think already. That's great. But it seems that, um, well, let me, let me phrase the question this way. With the discovery of gametes and chromosomes, it seems that the question of at least human sex was answered. There's only two sexes, and you're either one or the other. Has that changed at all? This has been something that's been called into question a lot over the course of the 20th century, mainly by anthropologists and biologists, who notice, as I mentioned before, that sex is not just a strict on-off switch. It's a multivariate system, lots of factors going into it, not a single one of those factors are solely determinate of the outcome, and not a single one of those factors has only two possible choices. And so as we started to differentiate between sex and gender, as we started to take into account the anthropological record around us, as we started to take into account different experiences with sex and gender, as we started to really validate and listen to and understand intersex people, we started to see all of these ways in which this system is fuzzy. And so you have this, this simplified answer and a really long and pedantic but more accurate answer. And the simplified answer is just that it's kind of fuzzy, but on a functional level, it's pretty binary. And that's fine. You, you have a bimodal distribution and you pick two arbitrary spots on the distribution and you categorize them and those are what you're going to label them. That's cool. There's no reason for us to now go out and look for 50 new gamete types and try to define a hundred new genders and sexes and all these things. That's, it's not necessary to do it that way. You could just treat it like anything else in biology and just say, yeah, it's kind of a fuzzy, weird gray area, and this is the model that we're using, and it's not always that way, and that's fine. How do I put this? Uh, is it correct to say that sex is binary? Because like from your answer there, I'm not getting the confirmation of it is binary. So, so, so th this is where the debate lies among biologists at this moment is that you have a, a camp of people who are saying, no, it is a strict binary. And a lot of people, myself included, who say that actually it just isn't. It just isn't binary. You can't call something with more than two options a binary. That doesn't make any sense. Um, and what's crazy about it is that we're all agreeing on most of it. We agree on the same data. We agree on the other. There's some argument about like the rate of incidence of intersex people. We all agree that intersex people exist. The question is, what do you do with that data? Do you say, well, there's two functional boxes and we've only named two things and therefore we're going to call it a binary, which is a bit of an oversimplification of that point, I agree. Or, oversimplifying my point, more than two isn't two. And therefore, you can continue just using words like male and female. That's totally fine. But uh, just you have to admit that there's a little bit of wiggle room in there. And this is where it gets kind of pedantic, is that there's different... When you, when you talk about scientific thinking, there's different methods, different types of, of scientific thinking in biology. For the same reason that there's different types of like combat styles. If you're a really good boxer, that doesn't change anything in like a gunfight, right? And so you have to learn different styles of approach for different situations. And the same is true for biology. So for example, there's typological thinking, which is this is what an animal cell looks like. This is what a plant cell looks like. And just these are just the strict templates that I can use to understand big concepts, to compare nature to my notes, and to put things into boxes that make sense for me. It's great for taxonomy, great for categorization. You're kind of SOL if you come across a protist, right? And so typological thinking has its place. Then there's like tree thinking. Tree thinking, you put things on an evolutionary tree and you try to figure out where they come from and why they evolved and what utility they serve in nature. Talking about, for example, um, you know, wings. Well, I understand what wings are for, and I understand when they evolved, and I can see the different times that they evolved across different taxa, and they do this, that, and the other, and now I can understand the history and the functionality of a wing, and if I see a wing in nature, I learn a lot about that thing, and then something like a penguin comes along that uses his wing as a flipper, and you're like, oh, well, fuck, it doesn't really exactly fit, and I have to kind of make a, I have to expand my knowledge a little bit in order to make that fit into the thing. And then there's population thinking 
which is where you look at the whole variation, the whole scope of variation across an entire population, and take all of that into account and look at the bigger picture of what this population is doing right now. And that's really useful for things like, say, for example, cancer research. Here I have all of these cells, and they're all competing for resources, and they have variation within their genetics. Which ones of them are more likely to be able to break out and access new resources better? Those are the ones that we're now worried about metastasis, and we're going to look at those guys better. But that really doesn't work on like an evolutionary perspective, on a big, broad perspective, because you can't take all of that data into account when you're looking over millions and millions of years. It only works in the present. So each of these types of thinking has their strengths and their weaknesses, and they're used for different reasons in different ways. What's happening now when we talk about sex and gender, especially in humans, looking at the big, broad picture of the animal kingdom, fine, use a typological model, use a tree model, talk about the fact that you know, males generally look like this and females generally look like that, and yeah, there's some variation, but who cares, because we're just looking at a pop, you know, this, these species out here doing whatever. Use the tree model. Sex evolved for this purpose. I understand that from an evolutionary perspective, it's doing these things, that's great. But when you're dealing with humans, and when you're dealing with human rights and responsibilities and dignities, use population thinking. Here's the variation of humans today. Here's what they actually look like. And they don't just fit into these boxes. And we're not judging them on their ability to reproduce. And we're not looking at their evolutionary fitness by which bathroom they're allowed to use. That's not what we're trying to do. We're just figuring out how to treat people in society, and it turns out they're a lot weirder than this textbook from the 1950s says. So that's that's what I'm trying to say when we talk about, you know, uh, uh, sex not being binary. Functionally binary? Sure, go for it. Talk about other species as binary. Doesn't matter. But don't try to use that same type of thinking when you're talking about real people in the real world. When we talk about intersex people, it, it depends on who you ask, but like, the, the rate of incidence you know, ranges from between about 0.2% to about 2%. And, and, and people on the suicides of this issue get real heated about which paper they're going to believe and which scholar they're going to believe and which number they're going to believe. It doesn't matter which one you go with. No matter where you put that number, we're talking about millions of human lives. You don't get to say you are this way because you fit this model and therefore you must do XYZ thing that just doesn't fly. It never has, and it never will. Well, the the notion that... Because a, a lot of time when I'm having discussions on this topic, someone will come up to me and say, yeah, but it's just such a small percentage, you shouldn't worry about it, which to me is just wrong. So, for instance, you know, we Europeans, they go over to Australia, and they find a platypus. Imagine if, like, people got really upset because, I mean, they probably did, but like they came up with a platypus and they said, look, this doesn't fit what we typically think of as a mammal. It's a really weird species. What do we do about this? Well, there's different methods that you can do. And one method would be that you go, look, we're going to just keep our binary. Uh, sorry, we're going to keep our understanding of what a mammal is, but we're going to say typically because there is technically something, however unlikely, that violates the way that we understand it. Or we're going to change our definition or we're going to readdress the way that we think about this so that we can break it down to more essential properties basically there's lots of arguments about the utility of a different position and it sounds to me like what you were saying there is that you recognize or you would say that some biologists some anthropologists some scientists they look at this and they go look i think that the, the most utility here is to just say sex is binary but yes technically big asterisks uh, asterisk here there is some variance. So there's some people that don't have XX or XY, they've got a variant on the chromosomes. Another thought that's expressed to me is that gamete type really is binary. So if you were to define sex by, based on gamete type, then you do have your binary and there's some utility in using that for a definition of sex. What What's your thoughts to that? Sure, uh, go for it. Say, say that gamete type is the only way to do it. Um, Bunch of questions following that. Number one, who's taking the samples before you assign pronouns? Uh, number two, what do you do when you go out into nature and you find that there's a lot of species that are monoecious or hermaphroditic and they produce both? What do you do with species that are dioecious, but like they don't produce them the way that you want them to or the way you think they should? What do you do with individuals within any species that don't produce any gametes at all? They're infertile. 
if I lose my testicles today, have I also lost my sex? Am I no longer a man? What's that all about? It just, you can define sex through gametes, through chromosomes, through hormones, through internal genitalia, through external genitalia, through all sorts of different ways. And indeed we do. But again, not a single one of those things is going to work all of the time. It's kind of like the concept of species. There's a million different ways we define what a species is. Because a species isn't a real thing. It's just a box that we draw. So you'll probably hear somebody say, well, if, if two organisms can reproduce to produce fertile offspring, then they're the same species. But that doesn't always work. And also, how are you going to go back in time and check which dinosaurs were fucking and making fertile offspring to figure out which one's a different species? I'm sorry, that's not good enough. And so we have lots of different types of species concepts. And it's the same thing with sex. We have lots of different ways to assess it. We have lots of different ways to define it. We have lots of different ways to work about it. The gamete size thing is usually the way that we do it. But there are also isogametic species, species that only produce one size of gamete, that still have like distinct mating types that, that we still would, you wouldn't call them male or female, but they still have this kind of dynamic. And they're also parthenogenic species. Common example is whiptail lizards. They're all female. And yet they still need to engage in sex with another female in order to fertilize their own eggs. So there you have gendered behavior going on to a species that isn't gonochoric, or at least isn't expressing a dioecious system in that way. So like, there's always going to be fuzzy wiggle room. And again, that's not news. That's, that's not anything too crazy. Biology is the study of generalities, and generalities are generally wrong. What we find is that if you're being inclusive of all of those details, you are also generally being more accurate as well. It, the, the common argument when we talk about intersex people is to say, well, if someone's born without two arms, if they're born without an arm, can we say that humans don't have two arms anymore? Here's the thing. Humans generally have two arms. Humans typically have two arms. By and large, humans have two arms. More often than not, humans have two arms. Those are fine statements that no longer exclude people without two arms as not being humans. So if you want to say humans are typically male and female, that's totally fine. Just as long as you're taking into account with that word typically, that it isn't accurate to say everybody with XY chromosomes is a male and everybody with X, y, uh, XX chromosomes is a female. That's not true. And so you shouldn't say it. So one of the strongest things about the original concept of sex and potentially gender for so many people was that you could base it on what you can see and yet it seems that now what they're doing is latching their argument on gamete type which precisely you can't see so it's like a complete flip it was based on observation and now it's just based on something you you can't analyze you don't get to sniff their gamete type like there's nothing you can do here um it's, it's a very interesting switch in the dialectic and i can't help but think think that it's done for those political reasons that you mentioned before it's not it doesn't feel earnest to me when it comes to no we're going to define it on a on an element that you can't actually see anymore like it, i don't know this seems odd it's the same kind of dichotomous bs as when we were arguing about homosexual rights you're a man so you have to act this way and have sex this way you're not a real man though because you don't want to like what are you doing then like what's the actual implication of what you're saying it doesn't make any sense. Um, and people like to pretend that, you know, gender is some sort of a scientific, a biological thing because it deals with a person's internal sense of themselves and their presentation of themselves when psychology and sociology are still sciences and deal heavily in that realm. Um, so what you end up with is this weird hill that people die on where all of a sudden anthropology, sociology, psychology aren't real science anymore. All the biology textbooks that talk about gender diversity and sexual diversity and transsexual people and transgender people, those aren't actual biology textbooks anymore. Those are new woke biology textbooks. And like, they just, they, they build this insane little wall around their bizarrely narrow and parochial worldview just to protect their own comfort to, to remain in the heuristics that they grew up with. It's a very dogmatic way of thinking, and it's, it's weird for people who claim to be pro-science to do. So running from 
that other position that some people hold with utility, I probably count myself in this one when it comes to sex. And that is where they say, look, let's just say that sex is gamete type typically. In fact, let's, let's go full, all the way. Let's say that sex is gamete type. It seems to follow from this that if you go with that definition, and you don't have to, but if you go with that definition, it just follows that you can't actually change your gamete type, so you can't change sex. The whole conversation, anything that's interesting, is going to because it's going to have more to do with gender, as we're going to get to in a moment. But do you see in their position that is what they would be committed to? Yeah, and I would be fine with that. Like, I, I don't think there's very many people out there that are saying that sex itself is something that can be changed or switched or flipped. You know, it, it's a part of who you are. It's a part of your physiology. That's totally fine. We're just trying to point out the fact that sex and gender are different things. Gender changes from person to person, from culture to culture, from day to day. It's something that someone discovers about themselves and might change in their understanding over time and that you can't actually really boil down people to sex because gender cannot be brought down to or predicted by sex. So when we're dealing with people in the day-to-day, -day, like you said, you're not going to go sniff out their gametes. It doesn't matter what their sex is. It matters who they are and how they're presenting themselves to you. And unless you are their doctor or their, their you know, uh, geneticist that's studying them or their whatever else, it, it's really not something that you really need to be that concerned over. Yeah, no, I, I, this is one of the funny things about going for the gamete kind of, it's almost like a pyrrhic victory for those that are trying to stick to the science to have their views justified. Well, it's like right now, you know, most of the people watching this video are probably going to assume that I'm a man and that I have XY chromosomes and that I have a penis and testicles and all these things. Have you checked? I, maybe I'm just on HRT, dude. Maybe I just got a big old larynx and a, a really bad scratchy beard just from, you know, taking some hormone drugs for the past, you know, several... And, like, that's the thing, is that people pretend like, you know, these these gender-affirming therapies are some new thing that only benefit trans people. I, I realize it's a little bit off-topic, but, like, it's important to point out that, like, all of these gender-affirming therapies, they're things that predominantly benefit and were made for cisgendered people, right? Hormone therapy is super important for if you're a man later on in life and you need testosterone to help you increase your energy and libido and activity. Estrogen increasing later on in life to make sure you don't have a risk of mental decline. Hair plugs and, and regrowth, breast augmentation, lip fillers, like all of these different things that are like helping you fit into your gender a little bit better and feel more comfortable in your gender. There's a reason why Viagra is covered under medical insurance a lot of the time, because it's gender affirming care. That's a great point you raised there. So like when when men get to about their 40s and their testosterone's on its way down and they go to the doctors with depression or something like that, one of the first things they're going to do is check your testosterone because it's so important. And yet no one would run in and go, that's not natural. You're not allowed that. We're not affirming your male maleness here. Actually, if you're just born and you're not that very masculine right now because you're getting old, you, you should deal with it. And yet really fundamentally, it's the same thing. It's like you're in introducing external medical technologies in order to confirm a, a disposition that you have. I guess that you could respond to this by cashing it out in terms of mental health. But that's exactly the point when it comes to trans people. Um, it's, uh, it's such a, it's, it feels like there's one rule for one, one rule for the other. And what's important to point out about that is that that's not only taking place in older people either. Cisgendered children, cisgendered teenagers also often need this kind of same gender affirming care all the time. If you're a young boy with gynecomastia and you're starting to, to develop breast tissue, you're probably going to want to go have that excised to make sure that you look and feel more like a boy. That is gender-affirming care for a cisgendered male, and nobody bats an eye at that. But, you know, when it's a trans kid, now all of a sudden, we're a bit more worried about it because, oh, well, they can't make those decisions for themselves. Like, yeah, they can. And also, it's not like there's a doctor just walking down the hallway with a pair of hedge clippers lopping off dongs of every kid who says he wants to be a girl. There's a long process of therapy and of doctors and psychologists and, and, and therapy, like all sorts of things that go into this. And it's backed, this is what gets me the most, is that every major medical association 
recognizes the importance, the life-saving importance of gender-affirming care for trans people of all ages, including trans youth. And again, just like we said a minute ago, it's only in this one weirdly politicized situation that we're pretending like the best scientists and doctors in the world don't know what the fuck they're talking about. So with what you were saying there, um, it, it got, it, that comes down to an internal uh, part of the debate, and that is whether or not children specifically can give consent. And that to me is one of the more difficult um, parts of the conversation, because in general, I don't think that children can give consent. And I actually have a different view for trans boys versus trans girls. And it comes down to the fact that if you transition, if you've got a little, if you've got a boy and the boy is really exhibiting gender dysphoria and they're leaning towards, it's, it's explicit, you've had it tested, there's people there and like, it seems really clear that this person is transgender. My view is that you probably do need to interve intervene before puberty because it makes such a big difference with the plates fusing, like puberty is very aggressive on, on the typical male. And so intervening quickly is something that really, it really needs to be considered. And let's say they are one of the very few people that as they get older, they detransition. It's not really that difficult because you can just, well, there's elements of it, but you can take testosterone and you will present as a, as a typical male. Whereas with females, as soon as they start receiving the treatment, their voice is permanently altered. If they do certain changes to their bodies, it's very hard to fix those things. And so I, my, my current view, and it's not very well thought out, but my current view is that there's probably some nuance between the two there. I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are to that and how much you thought about that topic. So I, I would push back on two points. Um, number one is that puberty blockers exist. And they exist for a reason, and they're safe and effective. Um, and again, we like to pretend that this is something that only benefits trans people. Puberty blockers were made for cis children who are experiencing precocious puberty, early puberty that they don't want to have right then. And you want to push it back a little while to make sure they have a normal development with their peers. That's what those things were made for. And they're safe and effective in that situation as well. So, like, if you're in a situation where you're saying, okay, this kid is experiencing severe center dysphoria, and we're looking at the possibility of medical intervention, but we want to make sure they get old enough to really understand what they're getting into. Okay, we have a way to do that. Again, there's no doctor just out there just just lopping off body parts of every kid who's like, mm, I think I want to be a boy today. It's that's not what we're doing. Like this is this Wait, is you're saying that takes Fox them. News is wrong on this. It, it, surprisingly enough, it turns out the 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 entertainment company with news in their name that has won several lawsuits by claiming that no reasonable person would believe what they say. And therefore, it's not as enraged. Turns out they're full of shit. Um, and so, like, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a real thing, by the way. They have won lawsuits by saying that no reasonable that's person would believe them. Absurd. Um, and so, uh, but like, that's, the, this is something that is, you know, best medical practices backed by evidence, just like everything else in medicine right now. And like, so yeah, that that's the first thing I would push back on is like there are ways well, to well, work just, around just, the situation. Just before you get to the second part, um, I think that's a great point. So like, I guess in my mind, um, because I'm like most people, I haven't thought about this enough. You know, I come at it, I've got a bit of concern, but you're right. You don't have to just go for male, female levels of hormones. You can halt it. That's 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 a fair point. Like, yeah, fair enough. Like, I'm already convinced, but you said you got a second Criticism. Well, and the second thing that I would say is that your main concern, you, you said you had a different set of rules for trans boys versus trans girls. And I would push back on that as, as sexist and reductionist, because what you're doing there is you, you, you talked about a you know, woman's voice is going to be permanently altered. Take into account the fact that it's a cultural thing that we value neoteny and females, and we want them to maintain as many prepubescent traits as possible and be high pitched and hairless and short and pretty and all these things like that's an issue with male culture and sexualization. That's not an issue with females who are trans. You know what I mean? So, yeah, no. T so on paper, I completely agree with you. I'm not calling you a sexist, by the way. I'm saying that particular view is rooted in that misogyny. I, t I totally agree with that. However, it's more of a practical and pragmatic perce perception. So part of looking into the whole trans stuff myself is to look at the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. And... 
if you watch detransition videos from particularly females that transition to uh, a man and now they're back to women, um, the, the effects are just so obvious with a lot of them because of the testosterone, particularly with the voice, that they struggle every day in culture because of, 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 of what you've just expressed. But the fact that I agree with you that it's wrong doesn't change the fact that the vast majority of people see that and then probably not going to get rid of it. So my view is more of a pragmatic one on, on that concern. But w what you've raised alone with the halting is is really interesting. It's um, I hope I've made clear to my audience that I haven't thought about this one enough. And I think that's clear from your responses. Well, and also, like, you know, th there there's other things that do that to cisgender women. You know, PCOS, you're, you're probably going to develop some facial hair potentially. And like I've I have met women who have stronger facial hair than I do that are cisgendered women because of some other medical issue that they've got going on. And yeah, they, they're going to have to deal with that. And that's going to be a hard thing. But like when you bring up detransitioners for that, it's important to point out that the amount of trans people who detransition is exceedingly rare. Like that's a very small, a vanishingly small number. And amongst that number, the va and I mean vast majority of them, are detransitioning because of lack of support from their family and community. There is a small, small percentage of trans people that reject, or, or I should say, people who have transitioned, who realize later on that they're not actually trans and they regret having gone through with that. And as we talked about before, just because it's a small number doesn't mean that these people don't exist. But that's the thing, is that, number one, the incidence of people regretting LASIK surgery is significantly higher than the incidence of people regretting, you know, getting gender affirming care and transition. Do we ban LASIK surgery? No. So it's my, just my a risk view would be banned. Just, just, just to be clear to everyone watching, my view isn't ban. It's, it's just like if that is an issue, and and you see that specifically, there's irreversible things that are done to females versus males using those traditional definitions and split from man and woman. Then maybe there's a reason to have uh, that um, that separation, but I, I do appreciate where you come from. Yeah, and forgive me, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just saying that, like, you know, we're speaking to the broad audience of people who are surely out there saying that, like, oh, we need to get rid of all this stuff. You know, we need to ban gender affirming care and things like that. Like, we, you know, we, there, there's pretty much every medical intervention has a regret rate to it, and most of them we would consider acceptable. And so, what it really boils down to is, if somebody regrets or wants to detransition or something like that they are going to need very specialized and very specific medical care, and they should have access to it. People who are transitioning also require very specific, very specialized medical care, and they should have access to it. Anybody in any particularly weird situation is going to require specific and specialized medical care. And so, like, we shouldn't be treating this situation any differently than any other situation. And indeed, I don't think that doctors do. It's only when we have this debate and say, well, what if one day you decide that you want to be a boy again or want to be a girl again or want to be this or that? It's like, you wouldn't do that in any other situation. So there's really, I don't think, any reason to do it now. I think it's 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 patronizing to say, well, you're going to regret it someday. I think you might, so you don't get to make this decision. Um, even with children, we have ways of making sure that they make that decision properly. Um, and I also just realized that we did not mention that this is a small statistic of people, so we shouldn't talk about it. So we should probably get there eventually. <laughs> so, Forrest, it's been great so far. We've been speaking about sex. I'd now like to move firmly on to gender. So maybe this will be a good question to start with. What is a social construct and how does it apply to gender? The, the simple basis of it is that gender cannot be boiled down to, nor can it be predicted by sex. They are just simply different things. And so gender, gender roles, gender expression, whatever, gender expectations vary from culture to culture, from generation to generation, from person to person, and from day to day. What gender actually is, is an individual's reflection and performance of what they and what their culture around them expects from their perceived biological sex. That's generally speaking the way that it's defined. But again, in gender diverse cultures, like say, for example, you know, twin spirits and Native Americans, that isn't always the case because you get to a certain point where you grow up and you say, actually, you know what? I'm finding out a bit more about myself. I've done some internal searching here and this isn't working for me. I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and act this way. And everyone goes, right, cool. Your life, you do what you want to do. And that's how it should be. Um, so that's what we mean by social construct. And that's what we mean by gender. It's something that is 
tangential to sex and re- maybe even a little bit related and touches on sex, it's, it's, but it's not predictable by sex and it's not the same thing as sex and it varies quite a bit depending on your culture and also just who you are. So when you say it's not predictable by sex, do you mean, to, are, are you on the one hand saying that it heavily correlates with sex, but sex isn't going to, isn't a necessary condition, or, or, are you, or are you saying that sex doesn't predict it at all? In the same way that it's simply not true to say everybody with XY chromosomes is a male and everybody with XX chromosomes is a female, that is just patently false. It is also not true to say everybody with XY chromosomes is a boy and everybody with XY chromosomes is a girl or a man or a woman. Man, woman, girl, boy, these are gendered terms. Male and female are sex terms and they don't correlate 100% of the time. That, that happens, you know, it, they, they're a little bit more fuzzy than that. Um, and gender in and of itself is very much spectral and very much fluid and could vary even within one individual person quite a lot. Okay, so let me approach it this way then. If someone was to say that someone's gamete type doesn't always tell you what their gender is, but it's a fair inference to make a basement... It's a fair thing to make an inference from until you have better information. Is that In that case, are they not using it as a prediction? So because so many people with us... I mean, they can't tell what your gamete type is, but you get the idea, right? Like, suppose they could. They know what your gamete type is. They've got your 23 and me. They're looking at your uh, your chromosomes. Chromosomes, gamete type... This, this is already bizarre to me, but like, suppose they've got that information. Um, they could probably... Is it? Would you think it's fair to say that they could make an inference about you're probably a man if you fit these categories? You know, in a... Really, really bizarre set of circumstances. Yeah, maybe you could like make uh, an inference, and that inference would be right maybe sixty percent of the time, and it'd be cool or whatever like that. But like the thing you have to remember, it, it would be the same thing as you know, if I if I see the type of car you're driving and the type of music you're listening to and the type of news you're watching, I can probably make an inference into who you voted for in the last election. But that's not always going to work. You know what I mean? And so like the the thing is that's really important to remember is that when it comes to gender. I am a cisgendered man. I, 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 am, I am a man and I use he, him pronouns and I consider myself a man and I, I exhibit what a lot of people would consider masculine characteristics some of the time. I can't freaking tell you what masculinity is or what it... I don't think of myself as a man most of the time. I think of myself as Forrest. I'm just me. And so like that, that's... I don't really associate myself with masculinity or with manhood or with, you know, being a, a, a man in my culture, it just it doesn't really resonate with me, and I'm not particularly interested in exploring it. It's not my vibe, and that's very different from the cisgendered man across the street from me who drives a big motorcycle that's loud and a big red truck in his driveway and blasts rock and works out and has a beard and all these other things that like is important to him as a man. There's no shame in that. I'm not mocking that, but like that's his expression of maleness and manhood to him. And mine is very different. And that's what we talk about when we talk about gender performance. Gender isn't just something that you have or something that you are. It's something that you do. It's an expression. It's something that you're constantly engaged in. And it's very different even within cis people. My concept of manhood and masculinity, I guarantee, is different than yours. And yet we're both men. And that's just fine. Well, on the association thing, there is... is one inference you can make that I've just I've tried my best for it not to land, but it always does. If someone drives a BMW, they're a prick. Like it just it's just across the board. I can't do anything about it. It's well, just that's, always that's undeniable. Consistent. That's that's, <laughs> yeah. that's science. We have that. Yes, that's down. pure science. Exactly. The Europeans Gender got that is a one spectrum. Right. Sex yeah. is, is you can make an argument either way. <laughs> BMW owners, all assholes. <laughs> <laughs> yep, absolutely. Now. On the topic of social um, constructs, I found that a lot of people think I'm getting into postmodern nonsense when I talk about this stuff. So uh, to illustrate that it's not, I'm going to give a few examples for people to to bite their teeth into. Uh, money is a social construct. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, when I pull out a one pound coin and you pull out a hundred pound note, um, we've just decided as a culture that this bit of metal is worth x and that this bit of paper is worth y it's just made up 
in the sense that we as a society have decided that we're going to imbue it with that categorization and value and we work with it. But there's nothing actually in it that's like, there's nothing in the coin that makes it a pound and there's nothing in the paper that makes it a hundred pounds in, in its own right. There's nothing there. It's just we've agreed on it and it works. So if we're saying that gender is a social construct, it's going to fall into the same categorization of that. It's There's a fact of the matter of the coin. For example, you could speak of the coin and say that it's made of metal. That is an analogy. You could be speaking about gamete type. But as for it being worth a pound, that is entirely cultural. And the argument here, which I think is very convincing, is that gender is entirely cultural. And it isn't a necessary value that it is a pound coin because it could be made of a different mineral. It could be a, a, it could be a note itself. I think the US has one dollar notes. I might be wrong about that, but like you can they do exactly. So like that money is a good example to get people's mind into what a social construct is. Another one is marriage. So marriage is a social construct. It's it's just society's decided. Yep, you're together. You get extra rights. You get to do this. You get to do that. Uh, time. The way that we tell time is a social construct. So what I mean by that is not time itself. There is a thing going on. But the way that we've divided it into seconds, minutes, hours, decided that, you know, a day is going to be how quickly, you know, us revolve, uh, are turning to be able to see the sun again. Social classes, that's another so uh, a social construct completely made up. A lot of us now just go do away with those, which, by the way, is kind of the point of feminism and of gender movements in general they the the, the cold real precipice is to get rid of any kind of expectations that are put on you um but social classes would count as a as a social construct so yeah there's there's a load of social constructs happy to move on unless there's something else you want to say about the topic. i would just say that like that's that's a really good those are all great analogies because like that's the thing is when you you know here in our culture, we historically have had two genders as a social construct, as an idea. Boys do these things, girls do these things, boys behave these ways and are expected to do to carry out these tasks, girls behave these ways and are expected to carry out those tasks. And the history of the feminist mu movement has been trying to kind of put those together and, and equalize expectations and opportunities. That's all fine, but like you can't have somebody from here in America or from, from there in the UK and have our understanding of gender and then we go over to Australia and we meet with the sister girls and the brother boys, the transgender indigenous communities there and say, oh no, 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 you're doing it wrong. That's not how it's supposed to be. See, we did this way and that's how you have to do it. That's that's colonizer bullshit to do that. That's not how it's supposed to be done. And so like there's a, a phrase, you know, it's, it, it's kind of a, a, an anecdote. I used to study international business back before I got into biology. Um, uh, and so I, I had this, you know, class in business school where we're talking about different cultures and customs around business. And they mentioned like, you know, here in, in America, you're going to shake hands when you meet somebody, go over to Japan, you know, bowing is kind of the traditional thing. And they said the ideal situation in an international relationship here is that a Japanese business person and an American business person walk into the room and the American person, um, hits their head on the Japanese person's hand as they're bowing and the Japanese person is raising their hand. They're trying to meet each other's culture and there's this interaction there. And so like, that's how it would be here is that like, there's, there's diversity in, in across cultural lines of gender and there's diversity across people of gender. And we're starting to get to a point where we're recognizing that. And so the ideal situation is, you know, you mentioned, you know, if I, okay, well, I have this person's whole readout here and I can go approach them, you know, you don't even have to go that far. When I was a teenager, I had a long hair, I had a ponytail down my back and I'm a very, I'm not exactly a buff muscular guy, you know? And so people called me a girl all the time back before I got a deep voice. People walk up to me and like, excuse me, ma'am. And I turn around and be like, I'm a guy. And they'd be like, oh, sorry. And they carry on about their life. And we'd have Dude, a conversation. They needed to sniff harder to get your gametes. You just type. needed to get those gamete <laughs> sniffs in. Like, but, uh, like that's, but that's the whole situation is like, if you approach somebody and they have a beard or they have, you know, a, a breasts or they have, you know, long hair or short hair or a, a job like this or that or whatever like that. And you say, hey, sir, can you help me change my tire? They go, actually, I'm a girl. Oh, sorry. Can you help me change my tire? And you carry on with your life. And I'm like, that's that's the way that it could be. It really isn't that scary. <laughs> you, you're mentioning there with respect in Japan and like the social constructs of respect. I studied advertising before I got into YouTube and one of my favorite adverts was, I think, I think it was a HSBC advert. And what they had is a British guy going into a Chinese restaurant 
And the British guy had an idea of his own respect, and the Chinese had their own idea of respect. And they completely conflicted. So the British guy, his idea was, you clean your plate. That's how you let them know that you enjoyed the meal. Whereas the Chinese idea of respect was, if they clear their plate, they're still hungry. So you have the, like, conveyor belt of more food coming out, and the English guy going, oh my goodness. And I'm just like, that's great. That's a good example of respect itself is a social construct. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some of the discoveries that led to a recognition of gender being a social uh, construct and how it split from sex? Because this is where a lot of people are, and they don't understand why you would want to separate sex from gender. And I feel like going through some of the discoveries, the basic, by my lights, made it so that you have to split them, um, would be interesting for people to hear. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of, we talked a little bit ago about like how all the different things that go into sex are variable and not a single one of them has only two options. So for example, you know, we've talked about, okay, let's XX and XY. Well, there's also Klinefelter syndrome where you have XXY and you can also have XYY and you can also have Sawyer uh, uh, Turner syndrome, where you have X and, and then nothing else after that. And you can also have Sawyer syndrome, where you have XY, but you still have a female phenotype. And there have been women who have Sawyer syndrome who have gotten pregnant and given birth to healthy babies. These are XY humans who are having children or getting pregnant because they have a female phenotype. There's De La Chapelle syndrome, where you have XX chromosomes, and yet you have a male presentation. And Sometimes that's because all or some of the SRY gene, which is a really important gene for sex determination on the Y chromosome, gets translocated over onto an X chromosome. Um, I think I said X twice there. Uh, the SRY gene is a really important gene for sex determination on the Y chromosome. It gets translocated over onto the X chromosome, either in whole or in part. But that doesn't always necessarily happen because every single person has the genes for both ovaries and testes and for male and female development, and it all happens upstream. There's a long genetic cascade that leads eventually to the body plan that you have today. So even without that, you can still have these changes because the sex chromosomes alone are neither necessary nor sufficient for proper male or female development in this way. I'm not saying health-wise, but like for that kind of development, it's just not enough. And so as we started to come to terms with these things, and we found people with, you know, uh, a, a complete androgen insensitivity syndrome, where the the you know, male hormones they have in their body simply don't have any effect on their body because they don't have the cell receptors for it, and so they still develop a female body, or vice versa. You have somebody like we talked about Picos a minute ago, where you have, you know, a, definitely a female body, but you end up developing things like facial hair and whatnot. As we started to get to understand these things more and more, we kind of had to continue saying. Yeah, but you're still a girl because of these things. Or yeah, you're still a boy, though, even though you have these feminine traits or these feminine characteristics or these feminine hormones or, or chromosomes or whatever. Yeah, but you're still a boy because of these other things over here. Um, you can look at people with, um, oh God, what's it called? Persistent Mullerian Duck Syndrome. You can look at you know, men with Persistent Mullerian Duck Syndrome. They could have part or even an entire uterus inside their body. Are they both sexes? Or are they just a dude who has an interesting thing going on with them? You know what I mean? And so when you see people this way, you realize that in order to treat them the way that we would treat a man or a woman in society, you necessarily have to separate them from their sex a little bit. Otherwise, you're going to have to go around defining 30,000 new sexes and having a bunch more stamps on somebody's ID card. And that just isn't functional. It's much more easy to just ask somebody how they'd like to be addressed and referred to, and then go with it. That's fascinating. It's like, it, it, until we started making those discoveries, I could understand why someone wants to keep sex and gender the same. But th those particular just seem to... I mean, I, I wouldn't agree with them for what it's worth, but I can see that their position's stronger. But those conditions in particular, to me, it, it actually renders the view of keeping sex and gender as the same thing untenable. Like, the, the, the one that really crushes it for me is, and I invite people that are watching, just look up the activists that are speaking out for them having complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. So that's, you know, a male, um, and the male in the sense, if you're going to use the definition with gamete type, or even and chromosomes, so if I'm not mistaken, do chrome if I'm mistaken, they tend to have both of those, and yet, because they can't 
synthesize the testosterone. They don't. Is it the cells that you mentioned? They don't have those to be able to uh, process it. No, they have the receptors. The receptors. They what they do is they completely present as female. Like they have a, like a vagina and and breasts and wide hips and nothing about them looks. Yeah. And instead of ovaries, they have internal testes that are cranking yeah, and, out testosterone like crazy that their body can't utilize. And what what's amazing is that, well, here's an interesting discovery we've just found. This is the equivalent of finding, say, a platypus. And it's to the traditional view, if you will call it the traditional view of conflating sex and gender, this to me is a complete destruction of that view because there's no way that you would have looked at that person before being able to analyse their genetics and have said, that's a man. You never would have done that. You always would have called them a woman. They would have called themselves a woman. Um, society would have called them a woman. And it just would have been like many other women. They're just infertile. That's That's it. And what, what do you do about the observation? To me, it, it made it very, very obvious, like pretty much on the spot, that sex and gender are not the same thing. And actually, womanhood has an open door so that some males can be women. Again, males being defined by the gamete type. It just seems to completely destroy the position. I don't know if you share that view, but... Yeah, it's 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 very much like that's that's what really gets it. When, you know, people ask all the time, you know, okay, well, then define a woman or define a man or whatever like that. And like, the fact of the matter is, Unless you leave it up to their internal sense of who they are and who they're telling you that they are, there is not a way to objectively define it that doesn't end up excluding somebody who belongs in that category. And and anytime the people pretend like they're oh well it's it's just chromosomes. Well, we just covered that there's a lot of chromosomal variation there. And like if you want to say those are just you know less than one percent of the population, you know ninety nine percent of the time. It's it's just this or that. It's either X, X, or X, Y, and that a correlation matter. Okay, well, first of all, it's not fucking true. But also, let's pretend that it is. Over 99.9% .9 of all of the atoms in the universe are either hydrogen or helium. Are we going to sit here and say that the periodic table is a binary and that lithium and beryllium and carbon are mental disorders? No. And so, like, this, this and then you go from there and you're like, oh, well, it's, it's fine. You know, there's chromosomes and all that stuff, but that's variable, but... It's actually gonads. You either have testes or ovaries. Okay, you could also have ova testes where you have tissue from both of them at the same time. And you could also have no gonads at all. So, like, what are we doing with that? Well, it really comes down to gamete size. What if you don't have any gametes? Well, it really comes down to this. And it really comes down to that. And it really, just go down and down. And then eventually you get to this point where you have some guy just, you, you either, you're, you're born with a penis or a vagina. And that's all it really is. And it's like, okay, well, first of all, there's situations like you just talked about where that can go against all the other things. And also, what about the Giva Doce people? Which, which are, it's a rare form of intersex condition. And I believe the Dominican, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, they're all born female phenotype. And then around age 12, when they hit puberty, some of them grow a penis. That's actually the word Guiva Doce literally means penis at 12. Um, and that's that's just a thing. You know, it's, you get hit puberty, sometimes you get a deeper voice, sometimes you get acne, sometimes you get a penis. Who knows what's going to happen, right? And like, what are you doing then? You know what? And, and then you get right back to the argument of, oh, well, that's such a rare thing. Who gives a shit if it's rare? It's millions of people's lives. And you don't get to tell them what box they're in because it's convenient for you binary for lack of a better word is it science it's not how thinking works and it's not how human rights should work either understood so this leads to an interesting question then because it sounded like you were making reference to self-identification so what what by your lights is a woman i i would say any person with the internal sense of of femininity that pervades and defines their personality and their perception of themselves it's it's not circular to say that there are feminine characteristics that we associate with womanhood. And if someone exudes those feminine characteristics and it senses those feminine characteristics, that they would fit into the box of womanhood. It's just, it's important to mention when you talk about those things, that this is something that is self-identified. You can't say you are X amount of feminine. Therefore, I now call you this thing. Like any more than you could look at me and say, okay, well, Looks like, you know, I, I got my, my decibelometer and your voice is just loud enough and just deep enough. I'm going to call you a man now. It's, it's just not how it works. So I think this might be a disagreement between us. So it'll be interesting to see what you think of my position because it's always good to get criticisms. It seems to me that if you're going to sign off 
on something being a social construct. You are saying there that there are conditions that need to be approximately met to be considered part of that, whatever that social construct is. So when I think of a woman, I would probably give a definition like this. A woman is someone who lives up to the social construct, it changes per society, that's heavily associated with secondary sex characteristics, behaviours and aesthetics. But by saying that, and recognising that it changes per culture, so really it depends on the culture, um, by saying that, someone does actually have to fit approximately that definition, which means that you can't just self-identify. So it seems that my position has it so that self-identification, and by, by my position I mean like the one that I think has got ut good utility, this is the one that I sign off on when it comes to gender, whereas your view seems, if I'm understanding correctly, would have it, would entail that if I told you I was a woman, then I am a woman. Is, is that fair? Uh, no. So I, I get where you're coming from, and I, I'm going to speak both to and against your point, because I think you and I agree a lot more than we don't here on that. Um, the, the major distinction I would say is the very last thing you said is like, if you tell me you're a woman, that does not make you a woman. If you are having that internal sense of being a woman and you have that, that internal femininity and like those things, and you're expressing that to me, you're telling me a woman, uh, you're a woman has no bearing on whether or not you are. It's just, you're letting me know. Um, and so that's the major issue that I would take with that. But to your point, like, you know, what is a table? Is it a wooden thing with four legs that holds food? Well, there's a lot of things like that that aren't tables, and tables are a lot of things that aren't that too, right? Um, and so, like, if I stand on a table and use it as a ladder, is it no longer a table? Is it only a table so long as I'm not doing that? What if I only use it for that purpose forever? Is it a table being used for that purpose, or is it that thing? You know, like, so, like, it's, we all know what a table is, though, right? Like, and that's kind of the same thing here. A woman is what a woman is. And it's, it, it's the same thing we talked about. Where the earth is what the earth is and a map is wrong. Our definition, our perception of what a woman is, is not going to comport with what it actually is. Um, and, and you talk about fulfilling the societal roles. This is the other thing that I would push back on. You talk about fulfilling the roles and the expectations of a woman in a society. I can get where you would come from with that. But just like when we talked about with, with defining you know biological sex a minute ago, there is no way for you to back up what you just said without excluding somebody who is a woman. You can have a super masculine lesbian who is walking around with you know short hair and a chiseled jaw and muscles and, and a flat chest and all these things and not doing anything that you or your society would consider feminine. And yet they're a woman and they have every right to claim that title. Well, so I see your objection. Your objection is that basically if you try and define a woman under any necessary or even just a cluster of definitions, a cluster of things that you want to meet, there's going to be some people that are women that don't fit that category, or they would say that they're a woman, or other models would say that they're a woman, but your model will not make that person be a woman because you've committed yourself to something. Um, I agree, and I think that's how definitions work, and really your utility in the definitions that you prefer to use is going to be something that maximizes happiness that maximizes uh, a societal set of categories that can be used but the when it comes to self-identification i think you're right to point out that that is the only definition that's possible that's going to make it so that all women that identify as women are women and all men who identify as men are men etc and all non-binary people as well like that's because like we can't just say these are the only two boxes a absolutely yeah so like you i do agree that when it comes to self-identification that's the pro but the problem is, is that a definition that has no, nothing in it at all, there's nothing that you've got to live up to, there's no expectations, there's no aesthetics, there's no behavior, there's no associations, nothing. It doesn't tell you anything. And so the category is completely pointless. And for one, that's a really serious problem with utility. You've just deleted, deleted what it means to be a woman. Now, some people would say that that's actually a good thing. Because the whole point of feminism is to remove any kind of expectations and aesthetics and stuff like that. But a lot of people would go, no, you do need to still have the space between a man and a woman. And if you're going to do that, you are going to be in the business, be it through referring to necessary conditions or a social uh, construct or what have you. As soon as you start signing off on a definition, you're going to necessarily be making it so that some people won't fit that definition. But that's okay kind of thing. So I do, I do recognize your objection, but I, I worry that actually the self-identification position itself just has, 
like there's nothing else where we do self-identification apart from names really like we uh, wouldn't do it with castles would we is there is there others please let me know i would disagree with you on that and and, and i would disagree with you for this reason if you take two cisgendered men I, I talked a minute ago about like my perception of masculinity in yours so like take two cisgendered men and ask them what does it mean to be a man what does a man do not your internal perception what is the societal expectation of a man different cultures different people, different generations, different days, you're going to get different answers. Same thing with women. If you take two women today, cisgendered women who have been living their whole lives as women, and you say, hey, what does a woman do in our society? What's expected of our society? For what, what, how, what roles does a woman fulfill? What does it mean to you to be a woman in the society? What's your internal sense of woman? All of those things are going to be different between the two of them, especially if you separate them by time and space. Um, and so, like, I, I think yeah, having it as an internal thing, it does make it a little bit fuzzy and kind of weird and flowy. And by definition, is it a social construct? It is, you know, necessarily spectral, but that doesn't reduce its utility. The culture is still there and the culture still exists. The question is, are you going to respect me as a person and treat me the way that I want to be treated? Or are you going to say, I grew up with this understanding of how you're supposed to act and therefore you need to do these things? And whether or not you include trans people or, you know, gender identification and understanding it, if you take all of that out of the debate, you have the exact same conundrum, which is just respect and how a person perceives themselves. Speaking on the utility front, if you can't have, if, you, if there's no requirements to what it is to be a woman, it doesn't have utility. Like, this, this, this literally means nothing. Does it need it? Well, that's an interesting question, um, and I think that my ideal society would be in a situation where you wouldn't need man and woman, and that everyone would be called they. Like, I would like to do away with it all, because I just don't think that it's a helpful category. But, that's not where we're at, and I fear it might not be where we're going to get for a very long time. And so, really, you do have a category of what a man is and what a woman is, and because of that, you're going to be drawing that line at least with a social construct, and that means you are going to start saying what does and doesn't qualify for it in the sense of does it fit enough of the categories. But um, this is an interesting piece of the the dialectic, and it's 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 good to have two people disagreeing on it. I've um, You're giving me food for thought on this. I appreciate it. Likewise, my dude. All right, here we go. Next question. Why do you think that religious people in particular are opposed to trans people? Oh, man, that's a great question. Uh, I would say the same reason why they're opposed to evolution and the age of the earth and anything else that knocks them down off of their pedestal. They have a dogma that says that things are and only could possibly be this specific way. And when they're confronted with new evidence, then that evidence must be evil and it must be out to get them. And especially when you have Abrahamic religions, like especially Christianity, you know, it says in the text that when the end times are coming and when Christ is returning, one of the signs will be that the whole world's coming against you and that the more people tell you that you're wrong, that's more reason to believe that you're right. And so, you know, when you have a situation where you're teaching people their whole lives that, like, the more science tells you this, the more you need to lock down into that, then yeah, you're going to have them coming out against this the same way that they do against anything else that they consider a moral evil, like, you know, abortion, homosexuality, um, surprisingly not shellfish or cutting the sides of your hair and beard and eating mixed fabrics, but whatever. Um, you know, just it's it's whatever is more comfortable and convenient for their dogma. No, I I, I totally agree. It's, it's a sad irony that those that claim to have moral supremacy are always on the wrong end of history when it comes to these movements and then they have the audacity the ghoul to claim that listen western civilization wouldn't be this good if it wasn't for the fact that it was predicated on our beliefs it's like we're fighting against you the whole right. fucking time like come on and, and you know you, unbelievable because you, you all remember all the, the stuff we learned about history how like before the bronze age Everybody was raping and murdering and stealing and lying. <laughs> and then we learned that that was wrong. And then we stopped doing that. That, yeah, of course. That's the one. But I think you really touch on on, on the, the big problem here. And that is the not seeing the binary as they see it. Not saying that it is this way with man and woman. I think that it is a massive hit to particularly Abrahamic religions. I mean, 
when you come in and you say, look, the Genesis story is true, man, you had to drag them kicking and screaming and they still are, are denying that like evolution is the, is the way, if God exists, that's the way he did it. End off. Like it's obvious at this point. And the reason is, is because it takes them off the pedestal and it, and it makes them question seriously, like if that's wrong, what else is wrong in the book? It's a really big problem. Well, if you wipe out the very structure of how they keep their power, which is with this tight knit understanding of how a family must be very patriarchal, then you can really understand by my lights why they will oppose this to the end of the world. And this is why particularly Christian nationalism in the US is their rhetoric is so reminiscent of basically the Nazis when it comes to trans people. Like it is really, really, really serious stuff. And I don't think the world recognizes just how bad it is. That is not even close to an exaggeration at all. Like it, it really, really, it is scary here. Um, and I think a lot of it also has to do with, you know, the, the, the privilege that we have as, as, you know, not only as you know, from a religious perspective, but as cisgendered heterosexual people, you know, this country, this half of the world was built for our benefit and for our pleasure. Like it really was that the, the, the people in charge have made it such. And so when you're in a position of privilege, having someone else ask for equality feels like oppression. For some reason, you know, people in a position of privilege tend to see human rights as a pie. And if you get more, that means that I get less. And that simply isn't the case. And so you have this argument, something you hear over and over is like, Oh well, you know they're they're pushing this on me, and I'm seeing every movie has to have a gay person or a trans person in it, and I'm seeing all these different stuff. And it's like, so first of all, that's obviously not true. But if it was, imagine for a minute, if actually all of the sudden today every new movie and every new TV show was all gay people and all trans people and everything, how would that make you feel? And now can you imagine how these people have felt the whole time when it's been only cis straight people the whole time? Do you see how that might be a little bit taxing on your mentality, right? Like, you're describing the problem, dude. We're trying to fix it. Yeah, it's, um, that's a funny phenomenon, man. I've seen, like, people, they just, like, watch a film and they go, oh, it's woke. And I'm like, oh, oh, why is that? And they're like, there's a black person in it. I'm like wow wow okay thanks for telling me that now now i understand your disposition <laughs> was the scary black man too close to you did you see oh wow oh my god <laughs> it's it's the same thing as like you know when when uh here in america i don't know how bad it is over there but here in america people are so concerned that we're we're turning all the kids gay by showing these rainbow flags and by talking about homosexuality and all this stuff that we're making the kids gay and like they, there's a lot of people try to conflate you know, homosexuality with homosexual sex. Well, oh, well, they're, you're teaching kids, you're grooming them, you're sexualizing, you're teaching about it because, you know, gay people literally never do anything except for blow each other. They don't have whole lives outside of that. <laughs> they don't have, you know, interests and careers and hobbies. And that. no, they're just having sex. And so if you're talking about them, that's all that it is. And you talk about drag shows, and it's like, well, this person's dressing up like a woman. This is inherently sexual. No, you just can't divorce femininity from sexuality. That's your problem, not their problem. And like what kills me is like if you think of it, if these people would think about what they're saying for literally one second, it would fall apart. I remember when there was this big debacle here. The first time I really started hearing about this, um, or at least paying attention to it. It had been around when I started paying attention to it. I remember it was a few years back when Lucky Charms, the cereal with little marshmallows in it, they introduced a new Lucky Charms that had unicorn shaped marshmallows. And there was a massive public outcry here in America that this is so gay. And like the cereal with <laughs> rainbow colored marshmallows in it now has unicorns. And that's going to turn the kids gay because they're just eating all the gay every day. They're just sitting there. And it's like, fuck, I tried them. They tasted like Lucky Charms. At no point was I like, oh, a unicorn. I wonder what dick tastes like. It never happened <laughs> because that isn't how that shit works. And if you seriously think, that eating a marshmallow or painting your fingernails or seeing a person in drag is going to push you into homosexuality, you might actually just be gay. If you're that <laughs> close to the precipice and that's all it takes, I'll see you with pride, dude. Like, fucking get over your own <laughs> shit and quit putting it off on everybody else. Oh, it's so frustrating. <laughs> <It's>, it... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm on board, man. That's, um... I was just thinking, like, if you took their logic, can you imagine, like, 
picketing outside of a school going, I am devastated. Do you know what they taught our kids? They taught them about World War II. Now they want to go and fight. Like, it doesn't yeah, work right. like that. Like, what are you about? <laughs> oh. oh, goodness. If I can also include, I think it's really fucking telling of the mindset as well. If you think that teaching kids that gay people exist is necessarily going to make them be gay. If you think that teaching kids that, you know, different cultures and different ethnicities and different genders exist is going to force them to become those things, you're exposing the fact that you don't know how to not indoctrinate kids. You are speaking from a dogmatic standpoint that I teach my kids to behave this way and so they do. If you teach them options and diversity, they're not going to change as people except for the fact that they're going to be better people. It's not going to force them to be anything. That's what you're doing. <laughs> You're confusing you with the rest of us. So what you're saying is like so many of these topics, it's projection. Yeah, it's, it's every, every single accusation is a confession. Absolutely. <laughs> well, talking of confession, that's a good way to answer that question. <laughs> what are your views on introducing they, them pronouns? That's great. Absolutely do that. Nobody should be bothered by that for so many reasons. First of all, as we mentioned before, because gender is a social construct, it is necessarily spectral and non-binary. So, like, why would you have two options for something that has more than two options? If somebody doesn't feel that they fit in either of these two categories, it's not fair or polite of you to try to cram them in one of those two categories. And for all the people that will inevitably rush to your comment section and say, well, they and them refers to multiple people, and this is just using language wrong. Here's a fun exercise, okay? Somebody just knocked on my door. I wonder who they are. I hope that they are interesting. I would like to talk to them. And then it's a Jehovah's Witness. Oh God! And then, then it's a problem. Exactly. But like, but like, the, if if you don't know someone's gender, you use the word they and them. You you do it all the time. You don't actually have a problem with the language. You're just looking for an excuse to be a dick. It's not working. It's it's so it's like on the one hand they want to not use they them even though they as you just said they do that's what that's what people do but on the other hand they think that it's really important that you call a ship she and not he <laughs> yeah, just like, exactly what is what's going on the amount of legitimate moral outrage that has happened in this country when candy wasn't sexy enough when they they made the green M and M wear sneakers instead of high heels actual grown men had actual anger in their actual voices when they said that the green M&M wasn't wearing sexy high heels anymore. They <laughs> didn't want to fuck the cartoon candy, and that was an <laughs> affront to their culture. Like, that's 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 what we're dealing with, dude. So when it comes to, like, oh, seriously, like, so it comes to this cartoon, and they're going to cry about it and go listen you must make them wear high heels that's not grooming yeah but like what they say on other things like what's going on that's the biggest thing is the same people who are gonna bring their kids to see the dallas cowboy cheerleaders wear a belt as a skirt and shake their ass around are the same people who say if you show my kid a rainbow then they're gonna be gay and it's grooming like i don't i don't understand it and it shows what really it shows the hypocrisy because you're seeing in that moment how important gender is to those people. My kid went to Hooters today. I took my kid to a gun range today. I took my kid to the, the uh, football game today. I taught my kid to be a man and to be tough or to be a lady and to be sweet or whatever it is. You are showing the importance of gender and gender expression and gender performance for your cultural beliefs, your ideologies. So if someone else comes in with a different cultural belief and a different ideology and a different idea of how they want to be treated, all you're doing is trying to treat everybody like your children, and it's silly. Mm, yeah, I completely agreed. So, okay, with they, them, all good. What about Z, Z, those kinds of pronouns? What's your views on those? I have no legitimate issue with it. They, they are, it's another one of those things where it's vanishingly rare and people like to pretend like it's this big, serious issue. Um, I have never actually met anyone who uses neo pronouns but again you know i'm just one dude and they are out there and what i can say is of my friends who do have friends who use neo pronouns 
it would be the same thing as anything else. If they go by Z and Zer and, and these types of things, number one, remember the fact that they are constructing a new form of gendered expression in that way. And somebody else who uses the same gendered expression that they're using likely has a different construct of what that actually looks like. So you haven't learned anything. All you know is that this is how this person prefers to be redressed. So you should try your best to do it. And if you mess up, you should correct yourself and try harder next time. And that's just basic human decency. Yes, we are changing language. That's what cultures do. That's what society has always done. If I go around calling people pumpkins and I'm aggressive about it and hateful about it enough and I get enough more people on board on it, eventually pumpkin will be an offensive slur that isn't allowed in polite society. That's just how language works. So yeah, for the same reason that, you know, I call my wife baby, I don't mean she's an actual fucking infant. It's just a word that we've co-opted as a term of endearment. And that's how things are. And this is no different. I, I, I know I keep coming back to that, but I really can't stress enough that like this, it's so ridiculous to me that this is such a serious debate when this is literally the same thing that we've always done with everything scientifically speaking and culturally speaking, this is no different than like when we learned about plate tectonics or when we learned about any, any it's pick, pick your favorite thing. It's the same situation. Just this one is, you know, deeply problematic for the, the, the cisgendered heterosexual uh, uh, hegemony that runs the world. And so we kind of have an issue with it and like, I, can, I don't care. Yeah, no, I, I th when you were speaking about not many people use these pronouns, and yet if you was to look at right-wing criticism, it's it's the mainstream of what, what left-leaning people are teaching it in schools. And Transphobes think about trans people more than trans people think about themselves. And, like, because of that, they assume that, like, 40% of the population is is, is trans or non-binary or something like that, when really it's it's a very, very small percentage that are just now being visible. And having them be visible is too frightening, what, I suppose. It's a slight tangent, but what really fucking annoys me is that despite studying, like, talking about trans people all the freaking time and posting post after post after post on them, they still sit there and, like, between themselves with a camera go, is it he, is it she? I just can't get... I, 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 just, I just like, how, how much can you study and, like, look at their positions and yet, like, never critique any of them and just go back to the basic, oh, they think men in dresses are women? It's just like, God, man, like, how is it so superficial? It makes you, it's a, the, when you live in that echo chamber, I imagine the same thoughts bounce back to you all over and over and over again. Yeah, just like a clarification of, yeah, the rest of the world is that dumb. That, that's what it is. It actually, it actually reminds me a little bit of a view that some atheists have of Christians, where they just go, man, Christians are mentally ill. And then they get in like a community and they'll be like, yeah, they're mentally ill. And it's like, Dude, do you not understand how expensive of a proposition that is to think of people? To think that most people that disagree with you are mentally ill. That's not a cheap view to have. And what I mean by, by this is that, really? Most people are mentally ill? Like, come on. Like, that's not... Like, question it. Like, that's really not a cool position to have. Maybe they're convinced of things that you're not convinced of. Maybe you've, they've been exposed to things that you haven't been exposed to. So when these communities start doing it, as they often do with trans people, they go, oh, they're just, you know, it's like a religion. It's just like, you know, they're mentally ill. It's like, brah, like, wow, what a take. All, all you're showing is that you are incapable of stepping outside of your own heuristics for even a second to check to see if you have any biases or check to see if you're actually wrong. I'm glad you brought that up because like that's that's one thing, you know, I do I do the atheist experience. I do Skep Talk. I do all these uh, various shows and whatnot. And it drives me up a freaking wall where I'm sitting here trying to, like, help people free themselves from the chain of an oppressive system, and you have some other freaking asshole say, oh, no, religion is just a mental illness, it's a mental disorder. All, all these Christians are sticking the head, like, you are not only, like, trivializing something very, very serious, but also you are just completely destroying all of the good work that we are doing here, in, like, the, the serious work that we're trying to do to make this situation better for everybody. It's such a shitty thing to say. Uh, I'll launch into that for 30 minutes. No, no, I, yeah, no, we're in total agreement. Going back to the Ziza stuff, like, I think that the reason why that hasn't caught on is that it's utility, there's real problems with the utility. So yes. if you've got this issue where it's like, look, you've got man and woman, and there's obviously you've got to make room for they, because for reasons that we've covered throughout, um, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Well, one way is you just have they, you just say that, look, it's, it's a spectrum done. Another way is that you invent new, 
uh, pronouns to be able to make up for some of the other elements, uh, some of some of the spectrum. But some of the negatives of that is one, it's such a dramatic change you're expecting of society that it's just not going to happen, like on yeah. practical practical terms. And then the other is that I actually think that it is it, it actually does it actually causes compounds the problem because what you're doing is you're creating more categories which are precise and defined, whereas they is just recognizing that it's a split. Again, you can do it. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, you do you. It's a utility thing, but I can see why it doesn't catch on very well. I don't think that you should have laws for it, though. Yeah, I've, I've taken up the habit of trying to just use they unless I'm told otherwise, because it's just easier. It's just it's so much fucking easier. And like, it's, that's, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, it's, you know, making more categories doesn't seem like a super awesome situation. But again, like we mentioned earlier, we're both cishet men. So like maybe this community will find that there's actually more utility and more satisfaction and more recognition in this other way of doing it. And then we should try to adjust. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty radical dude and I'm all for societal change for the betterment of human well-being. So like if that's what it comes to, I'm into it. As it stands right now, I don't see it as being utilitarian, but it's also not my call to make. You know what I mean? I do. Are there any specific scenarios where conflating sex and gender might be necessary or advantageous despite the push for a more inclusive approach? I don't know about necessary. In terms of advantageous, like I could see like if you were studying, for example, non-human animals, then like there's definitely gender expression and, and things like that in non-human animals that happens time to time. Like you talk about like, you know, pick your, your run of the mill off the rack population of baboons. You look at the males and you're going to have some of them that are way more dominant and aggressive and masculine. And you're going to have some of them that are a little bit more demure and maybe even take on some feminine characteristics and spend more time grooming than fighting and things like that. And so you could call this just variation within the males. You could call this gender. You could also talk about like social hierarchy and different things. At the end of the day, it's probably a lot more likely that you're just going to talk about sex. And, and unless you're talking specifically about their social behaviors and so you know what I mean? So like if you're talking about baboons... Yes, yeah, it sounds like you're saying pragmatics. It's for pragmatic reasons. There's utility in that. It depends on what you're studying and what the scope of what you're doing is for sure. Um, in terms of humans though, I can't think of too many situations where it would be advantageous to conflate the two, um, except for maybe if you're just talking about like medicine. If you're saying you have this anatomy, these structures, these hormone balances, whatever, I need to treat you this specific way. But as we said earlier, that's a conversation between you and your doctor that has no bearing on society. I think the thing that really separates us, though, when we're talking sociologically or even really just, just broadly scientifically about this topic is that humans are the only animals that have the ability to tell you what gender feels like. And what it is to them to be a man, a woman, a non-binary person, a trans person, whatever it may be. So if we're interested in science, I think the best thing to do in that scenario is to stop conflating the two, stop pushing people into boxes, and instead listen to what the people that we're trying to learn more about are actually saying about themselves. That's fair. So this question uh, feeds into a bit of what you were saying there. How... Can we ensure that acknowledging a spectrum of gender identities does not disregard biological sex, particularly in areas such as sports, health, uh, healthcare in general, and scientific research? So these those categories that you just gave, sports, healthcare, and scientific research, I would have very different answers for all of them. In terms of health and healthcare, you would you would treat it just the same way as you would with anything else in healthcare. I need to know what your body is actually doing. And then I will develop a treatment plan based on that information. Sex is a useful category in this way. It doesn't always work the way you think it will, but I guarantee doctors have figured that out and they were able to account for that a little bit. In terms of things like sports, on the other hand, I, I may not be the best person to ask about this because I don't care about sports whatsoever and I find it genuinely strange that so many people are willing to sacrifice human rights and dignity to spare football. But like, if you're asking me my opinion, just open things up the same way you would with, I guess, like, I, I don't know, it, it, like darts. Do you necessarily have to have a male versus female division in darts? Or can you just be better or worse at darts? And when you put everybody in the same dartboard, you're going to have a little hierarchy of who's better and who's worse. And if 
by chance you have one gender dominating that hierarchy or it kind of blends in the middle and is a little bit bimodal, Nito bandito, you learned a cool thing about those people. Maybe the other person should try different and then that'll be cool. I don't see a reason why you can't do that with every sport, whether you're playing football, whether you're playing you know, basketball, whether you're doing rugby or, 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 or boxing or whatever. If you're good at the thing, then you'll rise in the ranks to a certain point where you're no longer as good as the person above you. And I, I don't know why you can't do that. Uh, but that's just because I don't give half a shit about sports. That makes sense on that. So like, as, as you say, there's like so much to unpack in that one, um, question. So like my view really would be to separate sex and gender. And then some things are going to pertain to sex and some things are going to pertain to gender. And really it's just a change of language. Your doctor, if they're trying to check for, you know, cervical cancer, really they could instead of asking you if you're a man or a woman or a male or a female they could just go do, do you have this biological apparatus you've got a word for it and go okay you've got it we need to screen for it you know that's what matters it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman it doesn't matter what your pronouns are sports is an interesting one um i appreciate what you're saying and that it's not a particular um subject that you're you're too interested in i i really like sports i i watch a lot of it and to me, it's very obvious that gender's just got nothing to do with it. It's just because it's been heavily associated with secondary sex characteristics, it's got that conflation, whereas I think it's about that. But I don't think, and I think that this is genuinely a, a, a wrong view, um, and it sounded like you were espousing it, so correct me if I'm mistaken, but I don't think by saying that someone can't compete in a certain league, you've violated their human rights. I think that that's wrong, yeah. because what we do all the time in sports is say that you're not allowed in this league because because basically they figured out what is and isn't the attributes that make it so that there's such an advantage. So take UFC, for example. What you'll notice is that they put their leagues down to weight category and they do it by the smallest amount of weight. You're talking like three, four kilos. Oh, you're in a different league. You're not allowed to fight. And the reason for that is they figured out by running the sport that that is, the ca that is something that is really important to fighting, particularly in the way that UFC's done and boxing. And so they've made barriers. They've said, you cannot fight in the under 70 kilos if you're 80 kilos. Not happening. That's not a violation of human rights. That's, that's just the way that the sports have decided to segregate itself because it's based on, on what actually constitutes... The, a perception of fairness and it is only a perception of fairness because you can't really get fairness but as you were saying like we just got different views also that's a that's a very fair criticism because when i use the word uh, human rights in that way i was speaking in more broad context of like being able to participate in society at all being told what bathrooms to use being told what league you have to participate i was talking more about dignity and like acceptance in that way i see and by using the word human rights for that I, I was kind of being a very broad stroke, probably oversimplifying a bit. So that's a great point to make. And I, I appreciate you doing so. Um, and I think that like, yeah, that's that's kind of where I come from with it is I don't know how the structure works. I think your explanation of weight classes is great. If you're fighting in that weight class, that's great. For me, you know, I, I don't, regardless of gender, regardless of sex or whatever, I'm not an athletic guy. I'm going to get my ass handed to me no matter what sport I play and no matter who I play it against. If there's a professional athlete, man, woman, non-binary, no matter, they are <laughs> going to beat me at the thing. So it wouldn't make any sense if I was like, I'm going to take up football today. It wouldn't make any sense to put me in the men's league. It wouldn't make any sense to put me in the women's league. You need a separate nerd league for me. And so like that, that's kind of like where I'm at is like if, if, if all things were removed from it and you just played the game, I, as a man, would rank well below even, like, the worst professional female soccer player. I would be so far below them. And so it wouldn't make any sense to say, ah, oh, I have to be in this different bracket. From the Just put us all together, and I will be at the bottom, and they will be on top. And if somebody up is uh, way above that, great. But I think that would do away with a lot of the issues. Um, and I have no idea how that would work for individual sports. Um, with weight classes, be it competitive ability, be it times or statistics of like goals versus shots I, I, I don't know but like I'm sure that there is a non-gendered way to do that that would prevent from the 
current state of, of misogyny and, and unnecessary segre- uh, segregation. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, one of the best things I've seen actually recently is, th- is that they have started, sw- some, some organizations have actually started switching up the way that they categorize things with its wording towards gender. So it's not man and woman, it's female, because they're going with that definition because they're trying to get it with the secondary sex characteristics, whether you agree with the definition or not, they're at least going in the right direction. And then they've got open. And open it's not even man, it's not male, it's just open. So they... They're starting to recognize, thank the gods, that gender doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. And I, I would I would love to see that because I, I see such a problem where we talk about trans people in sports and immediately the conversation is just all these trans women, all of these people assigned male at birth are just going to dominate every single women's sports, which number one, look at all the not that happening that's going on all around us. Like you know, trans people have been allowed in the Olympics for like, what, 20, 30, 40 years now? I, I can't remember the exact, but it's been a few decades. And yet trans people are not dominating the whole of the industry. And even still on the upper end of that, there's that trans boxer. He's a trans man. Um, so he was assigned female at birth. Trans man is a boxer and he's kicking the crap out of every single one of his opponents. He's winning and dominating this area. And there's also research to be had in these areas about like, how you know you might actually have a disadvantage rather than an advantage if you're a trans woman and all these things and like but at the end of the day doesn't it just boil down to performance why is it such an issue to say that you know oh well we have to we have to segregate and protect these people here and make it so very different that and like unless you're seriously going to sit here and try to make this weird bioessentialist argument that men are naturally better at winning beauty pageants and therefore, you can't allow a trans woman in a beauty pageant because men are just naturally more beautiful. And if you're assigned male at birth, you can't participate. In it. it just it doesn't make any sense. So, so what do you think to this? Um, when it comes to sports, it is, or well, it could be argued that it is the case. To, to, to be clear, I think that this is the case. That a typical man just has so much advantage, particularly because of viralization of testosterone. And that's why there is a women's league in general. It's because testosterone which is the same as being given steroids it fucking works man like it's it's really effective it's a hell of a drug yeah exactly so like if you've got it so that there is no conditions for being a woman so for instance you can if you're a man and you transition to a woman you can keep your testicles you have basically steroids and you manage to have that during the time when your plates hadn't fused the, 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 what worries me is that even if you were able to... I think that, that that is a really big issue, and that's why gender really isn't relevant. It should be to do with uh, more of the secondary sex characteristics, the viralization, the presence of testosterone, what it does. Each sport is going to have its own kind of of uh, agreement there. First of all, I appreciate your use of the word viralization because I don't get to hear that word enough. That's great. Uh, and second of all, um, yeah, I think that's, that's... But that's the point of just completely taking gender out of it entirely, isn't it? Is to say that, like, if, if this person has, you know, greater muscle mass and greater bone density, and therefore they're able to lift more weights, it doesn't matter if they're a man or a woman, they just get a better score and that's where it lands. And if everybody competes in the exact same competition, regardless of gender, and then you apply gender to those statistics and you find that in fact, there actually is this bimodal distribution with more women on this side of it and more men on this side of it, and a little bit of overlap where there's some kind of fuzzy gray area in the middle, fine, but at least they all get to play fair. Well, yes, like this is where I actually do think that one of the concerns is that if you go with something too broad, you're just going to eliminate females, if you will use that definition. You're going to eliminate them from a lot of things. So if you take like the the female who runs the fastest 100 meters, um, her time is beaten by 100 male students in like universities or colleges in the U.S., And this isn't a surprise to those that are really interested in sports because testosterone does a lot. Like the hemoglobin in the blood is really important. You get fast twitch muscle fibers. Like just as the UFC has decided, look, weight category is really important when it comes to fighting. So we're going to grade it on this. Otherwise, you're just going to see a big guy beat the crap out of a small guy 80, 90 percent of the time. Um, In lots of sports, they have recognized that testosterone which is to say something that heavily correlates and typically is spread across the sexes um is that important so it's it's, this is one of those ones that's difficult and i appreciate you know we said our bit and we can move on but like i think that this is one of the key pinnacle 
topics that's brought up all the damn time by people because it's it's just so central to the broader conversation that's happening with trans people and i fear that people who do have that view where they don't necessarily care about sports and they think hey just let everyone compete it will actually lead to the elimination of females in in sports pretty much across the board and that will give such a piece of utility towards the transphobic view that people might vote differently because of that one issue alone because it's so present and obvious but um but hey, another area we disagree. No, I, I can definitely see where you're coming from, and like it, it, you, you, you make some fair points, and I can, I can, I get where you're. I, I'm smelling what you're stepping in here, but I think the the biggest thing for me is like, if and again, cannot stress this enough. I am not the person to ask about this. <laughs> but if if I, I if I was looking at what you were just talking about, if I were an athlete, which I am very not, um, then my main concern would be just like competing you know i want to i want to do my best and i want to see where i rank up and if i don't rank up high enough i want to try harder and so let's say for example in in some you, you pick pick your favorite thing where like there is a true dichotomy of like performance between genders and so like powerlifting you, you, sure and so say like the the strongest possible women in the women's division actually are lifting a little more than the weakest possible men in that division wouldn't it be worth it as an athlete to rank up even one more two more spots and you still have a strongly gendered division of the the spec up like of the weight or of, of the, uh, the 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 rankings of the scores but there's that little bit of interplay in the middle there that makes it a little bit more worth it for like the most competitive among them or the most capable among them i i can see how that i would make the argument if i was that kind of person if i was an athlete that i want that opportunity to excel and that's all that matters to me and I would consider it patronizing to say, well, you play with your group over there and don't come up here with us. And like, that's how I would see it. But like, maybe, you know, athletes have a different opinion and maybe that's, I don't know. That's a, I'm, I'm just a, I'm a reading guy. <laughs> uh, no, I, t I totally get it. And it comes down to utility, right? There's no right or wrong decisions here. It's, it's just like, what is the utility? What are you trying to achieve? What's, what's the goals here? You know, it's about utility, not about what's right kind of thing. Um, I guess the last pushback I'd put on that is that if you did that, especially in powerlifting, I don't think you'd see a female at all. Like, it would all entirely be male. And the problem is, is that very much feeds into the narrative that um, anti-trans people are pushing, and that is that the whole trans movement is really anti-feminine. It's, and it's, it's against female. And it, the problem is, is, by my lights, is that I don't actually think that that's wrong when it comes to sports. And this is why I want to separate sex from gender. And I want to say, look, it's about secondary sex characteristics. Stop bashing trans people about this because it's not got nothing to do with them. But the mainstream view from more left-leaning people is more akin to what your intuitions are. And I appreciate it's not your strong suit, but that is more akin to what people have. Um... But yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting dialectic. I would love to learn more about this, by the way. If there's any, if there's sports people's watching, just know that I will, I'm going to look into this some more because I, I, I'm trying to figure out what sports are in the first place. And when I get past that, then I will learn how important these things are. In your experience, what are some effective ways to address misconceptions or misinformation about the separation of sex and gender, particularly when engaging with individuals who are resistant to this idea? So we have a culture right now um, of sea lioning, of expecting like, oh, give me 10 scientific papers that tell me that the earth is round. Otherwise, I'm not going to believe you. And like all these things. And so like, and I, I've gotten caught in that trap way too many times where if you just say, this is actual biology, they'll disagree. And if you try to present them with, with you know, actual evidence, they'll misinterpret it. So my favorite way to do this personally is just to show them actual introductory biology textbooks that say these things and say, all right, so did the scientists who wrote this textbook and the professors who teach out of this textbook and all the young scientists learning out of this textbook, are they all wrong or are you wrong? And I think that's, that's, you know, my favorite way to be effective rather than trying to get into this huge formal debate about language and logic and this and that and the other, just here's what the actual scientific community is teaching. 
And if you can't get behind that, then I don't expect you to continue calling yourself your fan of science. Interesting. That sounds like the technique there really is to say, look, rather than getting into a, a debate about the facts, rather what I'm going to do is show you that your view actually entails a conspiracy theory. Are you comfortable with that? And most people are going to recognize that's quite a big price to pay. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. That really is the long and short of it. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not an appeal to authority to say, here's the World Health Organization's stance on gender being different than sex. Who is correct in this situation? You know what I mean? Who, who should we be listening to? Do you think that you are qualified to go to the World Health Organization and tell them that they don't know shit about health? Like, where are we actually at? So like, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier, like I can pull up for you several textbooks at this moment that, 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 that cover these things. We should do it later. Um, Good for it. So this is my actual undergraduate genetics textbook that I used to get one of my biology degrees. So you can open this up here to chapter four, which is about sex determination and sex link characteristics. And uh, here you see gender is not the same as sex. Biological sex refers to the anatomical and physiological phenotype of an individual. Gender is a category assigned by the individual or others based on behavioral and cultural practices. One's gender need not coincide with one's biological sex. For instance, the cells of human females normally have two X chromosomes, and the cells of human males normally have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. A few individuals may have male anatomy even though their cells each contain two X chromosomes. Even though these people are genetically female, we typically refer to them as male because their sexual phenotype is male. Well, that is one woke textbook. Give us the next one. This is an anthropology textbook published by Oxford University Press. And we open right up into the first chapter. It says, Many anthropologists did significant research throughout the 20th century and argued that culturally shaped gender roles considered appropriate for males or females in a given society could not be reduced to or predicted by the biological sex of an individual, whether determined by anatomy, physiology, or chromosomes. Today, anthropologists, along with others, call into question the assumption that human beings come in two and only two biological sexes, and that gender roles are built on those two sexes. Oh, but Forrest, that's just anthropology, and anthropology isn't biology. If only there was some sort of human biology textbook which detailed this out and answered this question. It is not correct to say that all XY individuals develop into males. Some XY individuals become females. Similarly, some XX individuals develop into males. And then there's a whole bunch of pictures and diagrams of genitalia that I cannot show on your stream, but it's, it's very convincing that there's not just two options in this system. Oh, look! It's a PDF of Campbell Biology, the newest edition. This is the tome of knowledge that you have to memorize half of in order to get a bachelor's degree in biology. That's pretty much what this book is. And if we just open this up and look for the word gender, the term gender, previously used as a synonym for sex, is now more used to refer to an individual's own experience as identifying as male, female, or otherwise. A person who inherits two X chromosomes, one from each parent, usually develops anatomy that we associate with the female sex, while male properties are associated with the inheritance of one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. Note that super important word, usually. And I can also type in the word transgender. Some individuals vary in the number of sex chromosomes in their cells, and others are born with intermediate sexual or intersex characteristics, or with anatomical features that do not match an individual's sense of their own gender, such as transgender individuals. Sex determination is an active area of research that will likely yield more sophisticated understanding in years to come. And let's go back to something even more elementary. This is Campbell Biology Concepts and Connections. This is the textbook that you would use for very early undergraduates, maybe even late high schoolers. We now know that sex is not a binary state with just two defined outcomes. Because of the complexity of the genes and proteins involved in sex determination, many variations exist. Some individuals are born with intermediate sexual or intersex characteristics, or even with anatomical features that do not match an individual's sense of their own gender, such as transgender individuals. Well, that is pretty impressive. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of science that you've just given us, but I can trump it with one book. <laughs> one book. 
one book. <laughs> I actually I shared a meme about that where it's like the the it was how how Christians think or how religious people think the evolution debate is. And it's one guy holding up the origin of species and one guy holding up the Bible is, I have this book. Well, I have this book. And it's like what it actually is. And it's like, here's all my data and evidence of years of experience, but I have this book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, on that bombshell, this has been a very lengthy and very awesome podcast. I want to conclude, Forrest, by saying that I love your work i love what you do i it's been a pleasure to see you explode on youtube and to contribute so much in such a little amount of time and i'm just looking forward to seeing where you go in the future just thank you for your time today thank you for all that you've been doing and uh yeah until next time thank you so much man that really means the world to me thank you so much for having me and it's, it's been a genuine pleasure uh thank you to everybody for watching have an awesome day and never stop learning